Hello! Welcome to Programming on Purpose with Python. This is the ninth in our series of narrated slideshows. My name is Mike Callahan. I'm a STEM educator. And in this slideshow, we are going to start to develop a web scraping application. And here we're just going to develop the classes. Using Python, we are going to develop an application that will scrape the web. And by that I mean access data from web pages without using a browser. So this is going to be much faster than if you had to look up on a browser. For our example, we're going to use Amazon and Walmart, but these same methods could be used for lots of other sites. We're going to learn about reading something called a CSV file. We're going to learn how to access web pages inside Python and extract data from those pages. The code will be simple. It's going to be a lot simpler than you think. But the concepts we're learning here are very important. In order to scrape the web, we have to understand how web addresses are constructed. Web addresses use a format called a URL. That stands for Universal Resource Locator. Now theoretically, a URL can locate any resource in the Internet universe, including a single file on your particular drive. But we're just going to look at websites. So let's break down the address for finding a Roku Ultra Streaming Media Player from Amazon. So we go into our browser and we do our standard search and we get to where we want. But notice that long URL. Let's break that down and see how that was constructed. The first part of a URL is a HTTP colon slash slash. I know you've seen that before. That just stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which means this is a web page. There are lots of protocols in a URL but that's the most popular. The next part with the www that stands for World Wide Web is the server farm name in our case Amazon. Then you see a slash and a description of the item. In our case that's not important and we can ignore this. Then we see a slash with a DP which is Amazon's subdirectory of all items. Then another slash, and this is critical. This is Amazon's unique key for this item. So using this key, we can jump directly to the web page we want. Then you see a question mark and the parameters that we use for the search, and we're going to ignore that as well. For our URLs for Amazon, it's pretty straightforward. It's just HTTP colon slash slash www.amazon.com slash dp slash and that key we talked about. For Walmart it's very similar. It's http colon slash slash www.walmart.com slash ip. Notice Walmart uses ip not dp and a different key. It's lucky for us that both Amazon and Walmart use a distinct key so we can jump directly to the web page we want. So all we have to do is use the standard search tools to locate the item that we need and note that key. That's what we're going to move into a file. Reading files is pretty straightforward. The first thing we want to do is develop a class that will read in a file that has the items we're interested in. We're going to use a very simple format, CSV. CSV stands for Comma Separated Values, and many spreadsheets can write and read CSV files. All editors can produce CSV files. And there are different CSV formats, but we're going to choose the most simple. Our CSV file needs three elements for each item. The website, 
and that's either going to be Amazon or Walmart. The name of the item, and this is really just for identification as the application is running. It's not critical, but please do not put commas in the name. And the key for the item on that website. So no spaces around the commas. And all you have to do is create a file in idle and save it as items.csv. Now you can use the five I have down here, but I think it would be a lot more fun for you to pick your own items. And you don't have to stick with five. You can put as many as you want, but five is a good testing number just for to get a feel for how this application is going to work. Python includes many libraries to accomplish common tasks. The marketing phrase for that is batteries are included with Python. To read CSV files we are going to use the CSV library. And in particular there's a dict reader class that we are going to use. The way it works is you give it a CSV file, dict reader will create a list of dictionaries and that's going to be extremely useful for us. At this point of our development we need to start reading documentation. So for our CSV dict reader all we have to do is in idle go to help then Python docs then the Python module index and it's alphabetically arranged so you do C and then click on CSV and scroll on down until you find dict reader. Now I know the first time you read this documentation you're not going to understand everything but the more times you do it the easier it will become. So you're going to see in our case for our use of dict reader, we're only going to need the first two arguments, the F and the field names. Using dict reader, in our case, it's just csv.dictreader. Notice dict and reader are capitalized because this is a class. And then something called an open file object. We'll look at that in just a second. Then we have an optional argument field names equals fields. And fields will be a sequence that has basically the title of our elements. So we have to open a file. Turns out that's very simple. In Python you just say f, that's some variable, equals and open is a built-in function so you don't have to import it it's always there so you say open file name file name is a string and then you have an optional mode now if you don't give it a mode it's going to assume you want to read the file and that's defaults to R which is what we're going to do you can also write to a file append to a file and there's lots of other modes available what this function will do is it will return something called a file object. Now once you have that file object you can use its methods to process the data in lots of different ways and you can also pass that object to other functions which is what we're going to do. Here is the documentation for open. Again help Python docs this time we're going to do the Python standard library and then built-in functions. And then finally click on open. And again you're not going to probably understand everything that's here but you can see we have file and mode and mode defaults to R and you can see all the other modes in the documentation. We need to start reading documentation and getting used to it. Using dict reader is pretty straightforward. We just import CSV. Then we open our file. Okay, remember we're calling it items.csv. 
and then we create our fields which will be a tuple and then the elements are going to be site, name, and key. Then you just assign CSV list to csv.dictreader. The two arguments are the open file and the field names equals fields. Now it's time to create our reader class. So reader is going to be given a CSV file and it's going to create that list of dictionaries. It will need two methods, init, which will open the given CSV file and save that file object as an attribute so the next method can see it, read. Read is going to read in the file object and return the list of dictionaries. And each line in the file will be converted to a dictionary. It's time to start writing some code. We're going to create a new file called webscrape.py and we're going to do our standard documentation. Then our first line of code is import CSV and then we create our new class and document it as well. Now we create our first method, the init method. And notice it has not only the self, but it also has an argument f name. That's going to be our file name. We document that method as well. And we have our first line, self.csv, that's going to be our attribute, equals open of f name. So this is going to open our file and allow other methods in this class to see it. Now, you may ask, where's the error trapping? Usually when you open a file, you have to have some sort of error trapping. It turns out the error trapping is going to be done by other classes, and so we don't have to worry about errors at this level. Next, it's time to write our read method. So we're going to create our tuple of field names. We're going to create an instance of the dict reader class. We're going to convert that to a list. It turns out that the instance of the dict reader doesn't really create a list. It creates something that we need to turn into a list. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Then we're going to close the file and return the list. So notice init is going to open the file and read is going to close the file and that's fine. We've created our new method read. Notice it really doesn't have an argument just self and we document it. Then we create our fields by using a tuple with site name and key. The way Dick Reader works is it takes your file, items.csv, and it converts each line in the file into a dictionary with the three keys of site, name, and key. So you can see how that works here. Now I want you to step back and think about how much work this little library has saved you. Never reinvent the wheel. Always search the standard library before you start writing code to make sure that someone has already completed your task. And if it's not in the standard library, then check PyPy, like what you did to download TK Enter Toy. You might be able to find it there. So we want to create an instance of dict reader, but the object that it returns is not a proper list, so we're going to convert it. As I said earlier, it's actually an iterator of a list, but it's easy to fix this problem. There are two ways to create lists. The way we already know, 
basically variable equals square brackets with your items listed inside the square brackets or you can use the standard list function variable equals list of some sort of sequence so let's go to the shell and test this out we create one list called a list and it's the traditional way of it we put in our elements a b c d and e we also create b list using this new list function and we just give it the string a b c d e notice that a list and b list are exactly the same so that's what list does it'll break apart any sequence into its separate parts using this you can see that our code is very simple it's just csv list equals list of csv list and here is the documentation notice I made a slight mistake I called it a function it's actually a class constructor that looks like a function now it's time to close our open file now it turns out when you're reading a file you don't really have to do this but it's a good habit to get into when you close a file a lot of things will go behind the scenes in the operating system it will flush data buffers release memory so it's always a good idea to do this it's very simple all you do is you just list the file opened object and use the close method and the last line in our method is return the CSV list so not only is that our method this is the entire reader class if you got behind this is a great place to get caught up it's time to create our main and this main is just going to test our reader class we're going to create an instance of the reader we're going to call the read method and then for every dictionary we're going to print the elements in that dictionary we create our main and we document it and our first line is going to be creating that instance of reader and you can see we're passing it items.csv next we call the read method of reader and we take the results and put it into a variable work list now we create a for loop for every item in work list and we're going to do some printing but before we do that we're going to take advantage of a feature format with dictionaries there's two ways the first way we already know you just create a template string with your placeholders and then in the format method you list all your items and so in this case with our dictionary it's item of site item of name item of key the second way looks like it's a little more efficient it turns out inside the placeholders you can put the dictionary keys site name and key but when you do this you have to tell format that this is a dictionary and the way you do that is by using a double asterisk in front of the name this is called unpacking a dictionary notice that the dictionary keys are not delimited with quotes inside the braces let's use the shell to play with this new style of template so we create a dictionary and it has two elements in it a name my name Mike and my job stem educator notice that name and job are keys and their strings and we create our first template the way we used to do it my name is placeholder and I am a placeholder 
The second template is my name is name inside placeholder and I am a job inside placeholder. We apply the first template using the format of the way we used to do it, a dict of name, a dict of job, and it works as expected. We try the second format and we just pass it a dict and notice that generates an error. We try the second template with the format method. This time we pass a double asterisk in front of the a dict and it works as expected. It turns out there's two ways to create dictionaries. The first way we already know using the braces. The second way is using a dict function where you say key equals value 1, key equals value 2. Notice key 1 and key 2 are not surrounded in quotes. So let's play with that in the shell. So we've already created a dict. Let's create b dict using the new style. You say dict parens name equals Mike. Notice name is not a string, but Mike is, and job equals STEM educator. So we compare a dict with b dict, and they're exactly the same. And we use that new method of calling the format using the double asterisk of bdict and it works like we expect. So notice that named arguments are actually related to dictionaries. That's how Python implements them. Now in the second form of creating a dictionary, notice the keys must be strings. But this isn't a big limitation because most of the time the keys are strings. And here is the documentation on this class creator. So we print our dictionary using the new method. And we call main just like we've done in the previous slideshows. We run our test and everything seems to be working. For Amazon, the key for Roku Ultra Streaming Media Player is that sequence of characters and numbers. So our first step is done. Let's start our second task, reading in a URL. It turns out there's another library that comes to our rescue urllib.request Here is the documentation on it and you get to it by help python docs python module index the letter u and then urllib.request Again you're not going to understand everything here but I want you to take some time and read it because we're going to need something a little bit lower down in just a second. So how do you fetch a web page? First you import urllib.request then you use URL open to create open a website and assign an instance. Then once you have that instance use the read method of the instance to download the entire page. And it's going to be big. Back to the shell. Let's try this new library. Now we're going to take advantage of a nice feature of import, import as. What import as allows you to do is to relay name a long import. So we have import URL live dot request that's a lot of words and characters. We're just going to call it as URL. So we create our website and that is pointing to the Walmart of the Roku player. And so we create an instance 
we use the URL dot URL open of wall site and the fact that we got a return with no error messages means that it worked so now we create another variable called wall HTML and we use the read method then we check how long this new variable is and you can see it's it's very large so is it this easy is that all that you have to do to read in a web page turns out that is true so far so good for Walmart we try the same thing with Amazon we have our new variable Amazite and that's just the URL to the Roku media player at Amazon and we tried to do the AMA equals URL dot URL open of Amazite and we get a lot of error messages but the very last one it tells you what we need to know URL live dot error dot HTTP error HTTP error 503 service unavailable what happened did the internet go down what's the problem why did it work with Walmart but not Amazon HTTP error 503 means that the Amazon server rejected our request the explanation is included in that documentation I told you to save under URL live dot request dot capital request and it turns out that the Amazon server is looking for requests only from common browsers since you are using Python it's going to reject you the way around this and it's built right into the documentation it says you need a headers argument for a user agent which will spoof the server into thinking you're a browser Now I know this sounds a little shaky but it's actually a common practice we are going to use a new user agent and I looked it up for Firefox for Windows 10 and it's on the screen right in front of you now this is a trick in Python you can see we have a long string broken up into two different lines if you have two strings even if they're broken up in a line with nothing in between Python will stick it all together for you it'll concatenate it for you automatically so that's going to be a nice feature now we go back to the shell and we type in the header for our user agent now we do the same thing we did previously with Amosite we set up our request object with URL dot request using Amosite and headers equals header that is going to do the spoofing then we use URL open and it works so now we do the AMA HTML we read it and we check the length and you can see that the Amazon website length is much longer over a million since we have to do this with Amazon we might as well do it with Walmart as well you can also use a different browser with a different user agent if you wish all you have to do is go to the web and look up what browser you want it is time to modify wet scraper so first thing we're gonna do is change the import line we're gonna add all these libraries re random time and here's where we use URL live dot request as URL and then we also want to watch for errors URL live dot error as URL error turns out we're going to use a lot of functions and methods from these libraries it's time to create our scraper class since we need no attributes for instances we don't need an init method we do need get HTML 
that's going to use the site and the key as parameters and download the web page for that item and return it as one long string. If there's an error, it's going to make that none, that special Python value, which is like a null. We are going to create two class variables. URL head, which is going to have either Amazon or Walmart's first part of the URL. And then we have the header that we just talked about earlier for our spoofing. And again, if you want to use a different user agent, go ahead. Get HTML will first gonna build the complete URL. Then we're gonna create the request instance, which is going to do the spoofing. Then we'll be able to open up the URL, read the HTML, and return the results. We create our new method, get HTML. It's going to have two arguments, the site and the key. And it's going to return either a string or none. Here's where we build the complete URL. Remember, the plus operator with strings will concatenate. So we have the website is going to be equal to scraper.url head of site. That's going to either get Walmart or Amazon. And then we're going to add in that magic key. Next, we're going to use the URL.request and create a request object. The two arguments will be the website and the headers equals scraper.header. This is where we're going to do the spoofing. We've already learned one way to open files using f equals open. And then we also remember that it's always a good idea to use f.close. It turns out there's a more efficient way using the with statement. It works like with open file name as f colon, colon is very important, and the block of code underneath the with statement is indented. Notice that's the difference between if you just use a plain old open statement, you don't indent that block of code. The nice thing is the second method will automatically close the file when the block of code is exited, so you don't have to use f.close. The with statement introduces something called a context manager, and there are many different context managers, and it turns out URL open is also one. So this part of the code could have an error. So we're going to put this section into a try except block. If you remember, we did that earlier. It starts out with try colon, and then that next part of code is indented because this is a block of code. And we use our new with statement, with url.urlopen of request as web colon and now we have to put another indentation for the block of code that's under the with statement. It's just one line of code. HTML equals string of web.read. Turns out web.read is going to return something that's not quite a string, so using the string function, this forces it to be a proper string. So, if it does fail, what we want to do is look for a URL error with a capital URL error, colon, and all we want to do is put HTML equal to none. So this is a very simple error trapping, but it's going to work for our purposes. And the last thing in this method is return HTML. Believe it or not, that is the entire Scraper class. I bet you're shocked that it could be this simple.
we got to create a new main so we can test everything. We've already got the instance of the reader class. We've already created the list of dictionaries. Next, we have to create an instance of the scraper class. And then for every dictionary line, we're going to get the HTML for that site and item. And if it's not none, we're going to look up the number of characters in the HTML as a result. If there's an error, then we're just going to say server error. So we've already done the first part of the main, so we'll just leave that alone. Underneath that, we'll have the web equals scraper, which is going to create our instance of scraper. So our for loop is the same. And then we do the HTML scraping. Web.getHTML. Our arguments are going to be item of site and item of key. If that HTML exists, then we want the length to be our result. If not, we just want result to be server error. It's time to print the result, but we have a little bit of a problem here. No arguments can follow a double asterisk argument, so item must be last. However, that changes the order we want in the template string. Now we haven't done this yet, but when we had placeholders they were empty. You can put index values inside the placeholders, and that's going to fix our problem here. So our line is going to be print for site. The web page length for name is placeholder of zero. So we look at our argument list of the format, and you can see result is zero, and item is one. This will fix our problem. And there is our code. When scraping servers, it's a good idea to pause a random number of seconds between requests. This lets the server know that you're not a hostile client. Hostile clients will attack servers with multiple requests very, very fast, trying to get them to crash. Python does include a random library, and we want to use the random int function, which will return a random integer between 1 and 3. Now to pause that number of seconds, we use the sleep function from the time library. Here is the documentation for both functions. And here is the code. You can see it's very straightforward. Randint equals random dot the call of randint, spelled a little differently between 1 and 3. And the actual pause is just time.sleep our randint. And that is our new main. Here is the complete web application so far. Again, if you've gotten behind, here's a great chance to get caught up. It's time to test and it's working. Notice that the Amazon web page link for the Roku Ultra Streaming Player is over a million, and for Walmart, it's less than 400,000. So everything is working. On to the next step. Now it's time to learn a little bit about hypertext markup language, but just a little bit. All commercial web pages use complex HTML, but all we need is a small piece that holds the price. We are going to be extracting a small string, the price, indicated by a sequence of HTML elements inside of a huge string, the web page. We're going to use something called regular expressions. 
Now this method of extracting a price from a web page will only work if the price is statically included in the HTML of the page. Fortunately, Amazon and Walmart use this method. Another problem is sometimes instead of the price they'll say see price in basket which will also cause this method to fail. The program won't crash, you'll just see no price. So we need to search the web page around the price to see if we can find a unique static HTML element. We can use the shell code we developed previously, but first let's find the current price of an item we want to check. We go to the Amazon web page for our Roku Ultra Media Player and we see a price. Now in these slides you're going to see that price changes quite a bit. But when you do this you will see a price and that's what you need to remember. It's time to learn a little bit about sequence slices. We already know how the index operator works on a sequence. A slice is a piece, not just one element, but several elements. Slices return a portion of the sequence. The way it works is you see a bracket which kind of looks like you're going to use an index operator, but instead of one number you see up to three. A start is the index position, same as we've always done, starting from zero, then a colon, and then end is one beyond that index position of where you want to stop. And step defaults to one. Start defaults to zero. N defaults to the length of the string. Let's experiment with using slices in the shell. So we create a string, and it's uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So we take a slice from the zeroth position to the third position and we get A, B, C. Notice it does not get the index position of 3, which would be D. That's how slices work. You always pick one beyond the last one you want. If you leave off the 0, it defaults to 0. If you leave off the end, it defaults to the length of the string. And notice that is going to be one beyond the index position. You can also say I want to go to the n except for the last character by using the minus one operator. And here you can see if we use bracket to three and then from three to the end, you get the whole string with no overlaps. And this is the reason why you have to go one beyond the end. Let's look at some Amazon HTML. Sections of a web page can be identified by an HTML element. For Amazon, we want to find the element for the price. And notice in this screenshot, the price has changed. Again, don't let that upset you. We are going to use Chrome and we're going to use the developer tools. So over to the right you see some dots. Just That's the menu command. So click on menu, more tools, developer tools, and elements. Now you see a little box with an arrow. That is the select element tool. Click on that click on the price and you will jump to a bit of HTML code that shows you that element. In this case it's span ID equals price block our price class 
equals A size medium A color price but then you see something price block buying price string that looks very encouraging then you see the price and it ends with a backslash span so our target string is going to be that price block buying price string now if you don't use Chrome you can find similar tools with other browsers and the new version of Edge actually uses Chrome developer tools let's test this in the shell we're going to use an import URL lib dot request as URL and then our header same as before then we have site same as before we set up our request we set up our web page AMA we do the AMA HTML we read it now we're going to look at our target is going to be price block buying price string we want to see if this is a unique piece that we can use so we're going to use the find method of that target on AMA HTML and that's going to give us a price location now we're going to use a, a slice from AMA HTML from 100 characters before price to 100 characters after price just looking around and we see it looks pretty clean we have our span ID price block our price all the class stuff but then there's that price block buying price string double quote angle bracket there's the price angle bracket backslash span angle bracket and then a bunch of carriage returns the backslash backslash in is a bunch of carriage returns now our next question is can we use this as a unique thing so we're going to use the count method Emma HTML dot count of target and notice it returns one so this is going to work for Amazon here is the documentation for both methods instead of find you could also use index if you use index and the string is not there you'll get an error message find just returns an index of negative one it is lucky that price block buying price string only occurs once followed by the price and our target is going to be end up being that string with the price in between those angle brackets we have a little bit of problem with price though we can't assume that price is just going to be two digits a point and two digits it could be it's going to start with a dollar sign but it could be one digit a point two digits two digits a point three digits it might even be four digits with a comma in there price can be lots of different values so in other words what we have to look for is a dollar sign followed by a digit possibly followed by a comma followed by zero to three digits followed by a point followed by two digits and notice I'm assuming your item is going to be less than ten thousand dollars now it's time to introduce regular expressions it will be difficult with the tools we have right now to try to write code that could handle what a price would be but regular expressions were invented in the 50s to do this exact thing to extract substrings inside of larger strings it's been used in lots of different languages and lots of different editors and a couple of years ago there was a popularity of something called Perl and a big part of the popularity of Perl was regular expressions because of that the version in Python is very similar to the version that was in Perl 
Let's learn about regular expressions. Regular expressions use a series of symbols to represent patterns of characters. And here are a few. A dot is like a wild card, any character. Characters that in a set will be included in square angle brackets. And you can put a dash between them. So like if you want A through Z, you just say A dash Z. If you want all the characters that are not in a set, you put a hat in front of that group. So our previous example, if we wanted everything but A through Z, you would say hat A dash Z. We also have some shortcuts so you don't have to have so many brackets. If you want any digit, which of course would be 0 through 9, you just have backslash lowercase d. The opposite of that is any non-digit would be backslash uppercase d. Any digit, letter, or underscore is backslash lowercase w. The opposite of that would be backslash uppercase w. Any white space character, which is a space, a tab, a carriage return, or a new line, is backslash s. Any non-white space character is backslash capital S. Following that weird little character, you can also have repetition symbols. An asterisk means zero to many times, and many there's no limit. A plus means that it must be there at least one time, but it can also be repeated many times. A question mark, very useful, it's either there or it's not there, only one time. If you say something has to be there X number of times, you just put it inside braces. And if you can have a range from x to y, you just put x comma y in braces. So going back to our price, let's build a regular expression. We want a dollar sign, so that's a backslash dollar sign, followed by a digit, backslash lowercase d, possibly followed by a comma, that's a comma, followed by a question mark, followed by zero to three digits, so that's going to be backslash D, brace zero comma three, followed by a point, backslash point, followed by two digits, lowercase d and two. What you do now is you string all that weird stuff together. And so at the very bottom of the page is our regular expression pattern for a price. What's with all these backslashes? Well, in regular expressions, a backslash means that the following character should be interpreted differently. And remember, I only have shown you just a few regular expression patterns. A dollar sign by itself means that this matches the beginning of a string. So if we want a real dollar sign, we have to do a backslash dollar sign. Remember the period, that was the wild card. So if you really want to match a period, that's backslash period. If you just have the letter D, the lowercase d, that will match the lowercase d. So if you want a digit, that's backslash lowercase d, and so on. But the backslashes are going to cause problems in standard Python. In standard Python, a backslash in front of a character represents a special character. For example, backslash n is a new line, backslash r is a carriage return, backslash t is a tab, and there's other ones. This is going to interfere with our regular expression patterns. So to turn off that interpretation that Python's doing, all you have to do is precede the string with the lowercase r. And that means this is a raw string. Do not interpret the backslashes. So our regular expression pattern, we're going to take the pattern we developed for price 
and stick it with the rest of the target string. Another nice feature in regular expressions is if you put parentheses over a part of it, it will actually extract that into what's called a group. So we're going to do that for our price. Notice our target string has a double quote in it. Because of that, we have to use single quotes here. So you can see below our regular expression target string with the pattern is going to be R. Remember, this is a raw string, single quote, price block buying, price string, double quote, angle bracket, the parentheses. That means this is a group, our regular expression pattern for price, close the parentheses, angle bracket, backslash span, angle bracket, quote. I know that sounds and looks strange, but believe me, this is fairly common with regular expressions. It's time to use the regular expression library that's in Python. Everything is in the RE library. All you do is import RE. Then you might want to compile your regular expression using the compile function. This is optional, but it will speed up searches quite a bit if you search for the same target multiple times. I usually just compile everything. Once you have your compiled regular expression pattern, you use the search method to look for your pattern inside the big string and you save what's called a match object. To extract the group, all you have to use is use the group method of that match object if it actually exists. Let's look at this, how we're going to use this in our code. Here's a shell. We want to import RE. And there's our pattern. And you can see it's a long string. Then we're going to take our re.compile, our pattern, and stick it into regex. Then we're going to use re.search of regex on the long HTML, the AMA HTML, and that's going to give us a match object, and we actually print the match object, and it tells you where the match began, where it ended, and it gives you a little piece of the match object. In this case, our match object is we have the whole thing. Sometimes you won't see the whole thing, but you'll get enough of the piece so you can see that it did work. So now all we have to do is take that match object and apply the group method. And we only have one group, and it's going to extract the price for us. Sweet. So it's time to add this into our code. We're going to create a dictionary that will return the pattern based on the site. It's going to be a class variable and we're going to call it target. So we've created our first entry for Amazon and notice we have a comma at the end there. You're going to see how this is going to be an extremely useful feature. It's time to learn another shortcut in Python. It's called conditional assignment. Here's what our code would look like if match colon, in other words, there is a match there, price is going to equal to match of dot group of one. If match is empty, that means that there was no price, so we're just going to say price is equal to the string, no price. This if some object then price assigned to something else, price assigned to something else is so common in Python, you can write it in a single line. It looks a little weird, and some programmers don't like to use it, but I use it occasionally. In our example, it would be price equals match of group of one, if match, else, no price. Notice, no colons. Just write it out. Now it's time to create our getPrice method. 
So we're going to document our method with our two arguments, the site and the HTML, and it will return the string. Again, this first step is optional, but I like to compile everything. It makes everything as efficient as possible. So we're compiling our regular expression pattern using the scraper.pattern of site. That's going to pull that Amazon pattern and compile it. Now we use the search command on the RE library for the regular expression and a big HTML, and that's going to give us our match object. And then we do that conditional assignment I showed you just a minute ago, and last, return the price. I bet you thought this was going to be a lot more complicated than four lines of code, but it shows you how powerful regular expressions are. And that is the entire method. Again, if you've gotten behind, this is a great time to get caught up. Let's tackle Walmart. Using the same tools, we see Walmart's element is a little bit different. It's span class equals price display dash inline dash block arrange fit price dash dash stylized and then span class visually hidden the price and finally a backslash span. So it looks like our target string for Walmart is going to be that price dash dash stylized quote angle bracket angle bracket span class equals visually hidden quote angle bracket the price followed by angle bracket backslash span. Let's test it out. We're in the shell. Here's the wall site, and we do our URL request. We open it. We read it. There's our target. We use the find method, and we look for 100 spaces before the price and 100 spaces characters after the price, and we can see it. the price is right there. We check it. Is it unique? We do the count on the target, and there's only one. So this will work for Walmart. Now it's time to check our regular expression. We take in our target, and we add in that pattern for price. We compile it. We search. We print our match. Notice here the match actually is truncated a little bit, but that's not important. We take the match and apply the group method with an argument of one, and there's our price. So we are good to go. It's time to add Walmart. But notice the code is almost exactly the same. If you look at what you did in the shell for Amazon and Walmart, it's almost exactly the same. The only thing we need to do is add Walmart's pattern string to the class dictionary. That's why I put that comma there. So now you can finish up the dictionary pattern and put in Walmart. You could add other websites here as well. Notice there's nothing in there that prevents us from adding other websites if you do a little detective work. Again, it won't work everywhere because some websites will dynamically add prices in. But it works for Amazon and Walmart, and so it should work for other locations. Here is our new scraper class with our brand new get price method. And we're going to test it now. We are going to modify main to test get price but only three lines change. If HTML price equals the web dot get price, else price equals server error. And then the printing is a little bit different. For site, the price of name is the zero index. But other than that, pretty straightforward. 
we test it and it's working so there's for Amazon the price of the Roku ultra streaming media player in this case is 89.64 for Walmart the price of the Roku ultra streaming media player is $99 and so on and so forth so everything is working now we just scratched the surface of regular expressions but if you need to search for data inside strings you need to learn this skill almost all programming languages support regular expressions in some way and there are lots of many online tools and web pages to help you learn this important technique when you installed Python if you look under the tools demo there's a program called redemo.py and it is a useful regular expression tester I have played with that myself so yet another way of learning how to take advantage of this powerful programming technique look at what we've learned in this slideshow you know how to set up CSV files and use them in an application you know how to access and download HTML from a URL, a web page. You know how to search for HTML for target elements and how to use regular expressions to find them. You learned about opening files and more about how the format worth method works for strings. You learned about different ways of creating lists and dictionaries. You learned that named arguments are related to dictionaries and you also learned a shortcut to conditional assignments quite a bit next we are going to develop a GUI for this application this will be our most complex GUI to date we're going to learn about new widgets menus ledgers progress bars and pop-up dialogues the nice thing is the reader and the scraper classes are fine we don't have to touch them all we're going to do is add in a new class called GUI So if you live in or near Southern Indiana or Louisville, Kentucky, I teach two hour free seminars at both the Jeffersonville and the New Albany Public Libraries. So if you're interested in getting some live training where well, we will go through these slides, uh, just simply call or go online to reserve your spot. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying these slideshows, be sure you use subscribe and tell your friends if they want to learn how to code in Python. Until next time, happy coding!